Good morning. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is June 12th, 2001. And this morning we are pleased to have with us Richard Sermon. Dick, how are you today? I'm fine, John. Thank you. May I begin by asking you how old you are? I'm 76 years old, John. As we all commented a moment ago, you're very, very well preserved. <laughs> Let's put it this way. I'm old enough to know better and young enough to learn. There you go. <laughs> what is your current address, Dick? My current address is 7 Sprague Road in Wellesley Hills, Massachusetts. And your marital status? Widowed. Widowed. And do you have children, Dick? Yes. And three children. And grandchildren? One grandchild. Well, let's keep pushing this. Great grandchildren? That's the end of it, John. That's okay. At, at your age, I think that's exactly right. <laughs> Where were you born, Dick? I was born in Cleveland, Ohio in 1924, November 14th. And raised there? Raised there in a small suburb outside of Cleveland called Westlake, Ohio. Can you tell us about your family? What did your, your dad do? Well, my dad was a factory worker, and my mother was a farm girl. In fact, we lived in the same house that she was born in. And uh, the strong German community in Ohio, and we were well-disciplined, schooling men a lot. I think my mother went to about the eighth grade, and her greatest joy was to see that we all graduated from high school, which we did. And uh, our, we had an excellent work ethic. I mean, those days, you worked, you had to. I mean, it was just one of those things if you slushed off, I mean, you had problems. Because things weren't that great when we were growing up in the Depression. Were your father's roots German? Or did you come from a, uh, what you would say, it was a German family? Yes, my, my grand, great grandparents came from Germany on my mother's side, and so on my father's side it was the same. They came from Germany around Alsace Lorraine. And on my mother's side, it was up around. Prussia, East Prussia area. In fact, the name I have is an adopted name because my father's name was Boyer because his father was partly French. But in the meantime, my father was, you know, was orphaned at the age of eight and was adopted by a family, a Catholic family, Polish Catholic family, uh, and their name was Sermansky. Well, he didn't like that word, so he just cut off the end of it and it came out Sermon. So this is I have a sermon today. And your spelling of your name is S-U-R-M-A-N? Correct, John. So, so you're Mr. Sermon. And, but uh, in another time, in another place, it might have been Sermansky. It could have been, yeah. And that's very really interesting. If the father hadn't been adopted, adopted, it would have been Boyer, B-O-Y-E-R. There you go. <laughs> when did you move east or come east? I came to Massachusetts in 1960. At the time, I was uh, I'd finished up at Georgetown University, and the wife and three children came along, and I'm looking for a job. So you were out of the service by that time? Oh, yes. Totally I, completed, okay. Tell us about uh, high school, when you were going to it out there. In high school, I, <coughs> I was not the um, ideal student. I have all my uh, report cards in the first grade, right through 12. My mother had saved them, and I, once in a while, I looked them over, and <laughs> I think I had about a tops would be a C, C average. A gentleman's sleep. Yeah, that's C right. Yeah. And um, of course, when the war broke out, we all wanted to quit. I mean, it was a big, it was a chore for the uh, superintendents and principals to keep us in school. We want to go. We want to get this thing over with. Of course, we all did. We all stayed our uh, time to graduate, which was six, eight weeks more, and we received our diploma. And uh, tell us where you were on Pearl Harbor Day. Pearl Harbor Day, I was at the old farmhouse where we lived, and out in back we had this small building. And it was my brother and a uh, close friend of ours and myself. We were sitting on the roof of this thing, which is not maybe eight feet tall. And we were uh, rifle practicing with our 22s. You know, there was plenty of room at that time. Stick a can or a bottle up on a grape post and, you know, fire at. Because we were, we were brought up with guns. We had no problem in schools or anything with guns. We all, at the hunting season, at November 15th, the majority of the boys left school, and the people knew it. I mean, the, these teachers, 
teacher would say, well, bring me a pheasant feather, you know. But that was one of those things, and we never had problems with guns in or out of school. No, no such thing as bringing a gun to school. Is that the day you heard about Pearl Harbor? That was the day Pearl Harbor broke out, and it was just about uh, one, a little after one o'clock. It was Sunday, and we had, the, had a radio, as it was, and uh, it was on the radio about it. Japanese had bombed Pearl Harbor. Did you have any idea where Pearl Harbor was? That <laughs> was my next comment. Yeah. We're saying, where's Pearl Harbor? <laughs> well, Pearl Harbor's in the Hawaiians. <laughs> The whole fleet we heard about. Now, we, the, the American people didn't really know the damage at Pearl Harbor until just about a year later. That's correct. And I think there were 19 ships damaged. What did you guys think? You're out there with rifles. Uh, did you think you would be drawn into what Roosevelt declared war uh, the next day? Yes, we thought that. We, th we, didn't, know, we did, didn't know when it would be, but at that time, then the word came out, everybody uh, had to register, and when you were 18, you received your draft notice. We were, I was in high school when I received the draft notice from, Mr. from uh, President Roosevelt. Greetings. You were 18 years old in high yeah. school. The guys you were out with, or others of your friends, did you talk about going into the service and what particular yeah. service? That's all we talked about. What did you decide personally? Personally, I decided the Marine Corps because my younger brother said, well, he was going in the Navy. And my older brother said, well, he was going in the Army. And I did a little research, and I talked to different people, and I said, well, I'm going in the Marines. Why the, why the Marine Corps? Well, I like, I, I like their, uh, their organization. I like their attitude. Of course, at this age of 18, you want to be with the best. And all you ever heard about the Marine Corps, which is true today, the few, the proud, the best, the way I put it. I mean, we have no problem. Only problems we'll ever have is with our inner service, sister services. You know, battle with the army and the navy and the those coast other, guard. Those other services. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we, did you did you tell us a second ago that you had um, you were, you stayed in school, didn't leave to join the service? Yeah, I stayed six weeks more. So you were a senior. That's uh, right. When Pearl Harbor. Eighteen came years on. old. And instead of rushing down and uh, taking off, you waited six weeks. And where did you enter? The, in, in Cleveland? Cleveland. Tell us about going down and signing up. Well, you, you signed up, and then you had, got your notice to report to the draft board. And then you went through these lines. You went through this. Uh, first, there was a, a psychologist asked you various questions. Of course, we're 18 years old. We didn't. Know what's going on? Yeah, we didn't. Do you ever have anything to do with girls? Yeah, no. Yes, yes. All this and that. Ah, right, you're okay. And then you take this physical, which was you know it's a basic physical. And then you got in line, and when you at that time you had a choice. You could take the army, navy, marines, coast guard, whatever. So it came to my choice. I said I'll take the marines. And the fellow behind me was in my class. He took the Marines also, so our serial number is just one digit apart. Now, when it's all over, there must have been 7,500 people that day. The recruits in the Marine Corps filled a station wagon. There were five of us out of all that that took the Marines. Most of them went in the Army or Navy. Of that 75, yeah. were these a lot of classmates, guys that uh, you knew that you'd grown up with? Well, no, I didn't know a lot of them. The only ones I would know were the ones that came from Westlake High School. But Most how of them many from, of, the, of them Well, we only, there. at that time, we only had about, uh, well, there were only 46 in the class. At that time, we probably had five or six people from our class at that time, and probably after that, others were called. So your affiliation with the Corps began with one other guy yeah. uh, whose serial number was one behind That's you. That's exactly right, yes. And. You went home and told your folks you'd join the Marine Corps. That's it. That's the what way it was worked. The reaction then you there. get your picture in the paper. And what did your father say to you? Well, he he was an Army man, in World War One, and uh, he didn't they didn't have much to say. They knew we had to go, and you know, they was it was a sad sort of a thing, but not to us, not to the eighteen year old kid. 
the parents, it was sad for parents, really, to see their kids go up. We couldn't wait to get out there. We're going to get them. We're going to this. We're going to that. Under what circumstances did you sign up? Did you sign up for the duration plus six months? That, that's a duration six months, World War II. So uh, that was an open-ended book. Right. Uh, you got out when the war was over. That's right, sir. Okay. Um, how long before they picked you up and sent you off to Paris Island? Well, I left uh, July 29th from Cleveland, Ohio. But I didn't go to Paris Island. I'm a, <coughs> what is known as a Hollywood Marine. That means we went to San Diego Recruit Depot. We had one on each coast now. Paris Island was filled with people. We just couldn't take any more. So they sent us all the way to San Diego. Really? That's interesting. And uh, Tell us about the, did you go out on a train? Went out on a train, took about four or five days, loaded with uh, recruits. All so, going to uh, all San All going to different places, and even servicemen that were in, they were going back and forth. That time, I mean, cities were just, all you saw were uniforms, uniforms, uniforms. Oh, How time. far away from home had you been up to that point? Up to that point, the farthest I was away from home was uh, 80 miles. Now you're on the West Coast. Now we're 2,500 miles away from home. And looking at something called the Pacific Ocean. That's right. And here we are at home where the mother and father there are kind of guys. Now we're on our own. I mean, you make friends. and. Most of all, we just didn't know. We just did what we had to do to get there, but it was a traumatic thing in a way. Tell us a little bit about Marine Corps boot camp. Marine Corps boot camp at that time was seven weeks long. Now, three weeks of that seven weeks is on the rifle range. Now, <clears throat> in the Marine Corps, every man is a basic infantry man, whether he's a cook or a baker or a clerk in the band, whatever. Now what we learned in boot camp was our rifle, which was the M1, and we fired it for three weeks on the range. We learned about hand grenades. We learned about bayonet. We had bayonet training. We had demolitions, camouflage, field sanitation, drilling. And that was about it in our gear, the different gear we learned about. This is all in seven weeks. The point is, they needed infantrymen, they needed line company people. And a lot of them went right from boot camp, which was seven weeks, right to a line camp, or a line company out at Camp Pendleton, where they did their uh, extended infantry training. They got into an outfit. During that seven weeks, did you take some tests uh, for the Corps to assess your skills? Yes, we took tests. Uh, well, to, half of the uh, platoon was make PFC, but you had to do had to have three qualifications. You had to pass a simple arithmetic test, you had to be able to swim 50 yards, and you had to qualify with your rifle. What did you shoot on record day? On record day, I shot marksman. I think it was 292. Started at the 200-yard line, you all the way back to the 500-yard line. Prone, actually. I mean, and the results of that test sent you where? Did you go to Camp Pendleton? No, after that, yeah. we went. We took another test out of boot camp to find out where we were going to go, whether we were going into infantry or whether we were going into mm -hmm. radio or artillery. We took that, that test. They found out that I was pretty good in uh, communications for some reason or other, so they sent me to telephone school, where as did that? our cameraman, Bob Dunbar. At the same school. <laughs> where, where was that? School? That was right on, on the base at San Diego. S another six weeks, of telephone school. Learn how to climb, make splices, the new the switchboards, the double eight telephone. This bringing you up somewhere into about September of '43. That's about that's about right. September. Yeah. Yep. What did you learn at telephone school? Well, I learned how to make a. Uh, combat splice and a seizing wire splice, how to uh, set up a BD-71 and BD-72 switchboards. One had six, six drops, the other had 12. Uh, how to uh, set up a phantom circuit, a simplex phantom circuit with, with existing lines. How to climb a pole using climbers. And all the other little bits of equipment that we had, you had very simple little pieces of equipment you might use right in combat. Most of the time, 
Yeah, we had, well, we had the sound power. Then we had the, the 110 uh, telephone wire itself. It was a half a mile on a drum, which is heavy. But in combat, you had the one, I believe it's the 150 wire. You could put a uh, mile of it on a drum about like that, a small drum. You could really carry it. You know, you couldn't carry a, 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 uh, a DR-4 in combat. It was just too heavy. It's a great big drum. That was more or less of a uh, permanent setup. Of all the things that you might have done in the Corps, were you pleased with the assignment you got? Yes, I was. I did wanted artillery, but I was pleased with... Did you like the work and the things yes, you were... Yes, I did. In fact, I went with the telephone company after I got out for a couple of three years. Be from what you just told me and what you eventually did in the Corps, did you feel your training was good, that they uh, taught you well? Yes, they did. I was not... not uh, I had no uh, problems with the, the uh, training. It was just excellent training. We had the people we had for instructors had just come back from Guadalcanal, and they they're the ones that knew about you know the tricks and trades of communications and this and that and what you should do or not do and this and that. The telephone uh, is the most secretive of all communications because you got to have another fella into that line to hear you, but with a radio, I mean that's a frequency. If oh, anyone can pick it up if you got the frequency. But um, excellent training, very good training. Did you, where did you go after that school? After that school, we were shipped to uh, Honolulu. We spent three months there, and out of those three months, I went to, uh, half our company went to the island of, of uh, Kauai. The other half went to Maui for where, further training. Where were you on Kauai? I don't even know the name of the town. Were you at Barking Sands or uh, over at Now Willy Willy or? Now that's the word. Now Willy Willy. Uh, that's it. Now Willy Willy. <laughs> I never forgot. To, that's it. And, uh, and for three months, what did you do? Well, we were there just six weeks there, just regular oh. training. In fact, we even learned the uh, the Morse code from the radio people. You know, and just going through setups, field exercises. This is about the, the fall of 43. What was going on in the war at that time? What did you hear that was going the fall on? The fall of 43? Well, let's see, the marshals, the campaign was, I think the marshals was about finished. Uh, I don't know, I don't, I'm not sure about what was ahead of it. I know we got there in 44, and our next move was Saipan. That's, uh, that's June of 44. That's Ju yeah, June 15th of 44. Yeah. Did you go ashore at Saipan? Yeah, we got there at D-Day. We went ashore about 10 days later. Okay. Tell us about, did you leave Hawaii and sail to Saipan? Yeah. It took us 34 days from uh, uh, Honolulu to uh, Saipan, zigzagging here and there in different courses. Went with the whole, with the whole division. Was Is this the fourth or what? Second and fourth division and fourth, were on yeah. uh, Saipan. Can you tell us about being on a ship and seeing an island come up out of the water and what your feelings are about uh, there's guys there that they, they want to kill you? Well, this is it. I mean, you see this island. It's a beautiful sight. I mean, green all over, nice rolling hills and this and that. And, of course, it's punctuated by the big guns of the battleships and the planes, and they're tearing it apart, especially the beach. And, uh, of course, when we landed, it, it was... There was a fellow, the pilot was just shot down. He was, in fact, he had buried him right in his parachute. And then now you're starting to find out what this is all about. We were so eager to get into. Isn't Saipan one of the rare places in, in the marine history uh, in World War II where you attack cities and towns? That most other islands, uh, you know, were just plain well, old jungle. That was our. F yeah, we had to destroy. We had to destroy Garapan, the capital. And they had opportunities to give, it, to give up, but they wouldn't. In fact, uh, they even had the women. There were times you, you had to kill women, too, because uh, they were firing at you, you find out. You, we weren't out killing civilians. I mean, the civilians got out of there as much as possible. They were, there were plenty of places for them to go that were not military targets. But we had to destroy Garapan. We didn't want to, but they just wouldn't give it up. What specifically did you do? When, when you were in combat there? 
Are you, were you, are you humping a radio around? Or? No, I'm working with field telephone work. We set up our switchboard at our place, and we're connecting all the different organizations that, that are out there. So you can pick up a phone anywhere and get any organization you wanted, really. But, I mean, during combat, we're just involved in what is going on in the front, and we're not too concerned about uh, places that we haven't even taken yet. What were, what were you armed with? We were armed with a, uh, a carbine, a 30 caliber carbine. And uh, the infantry were armed with the M1 rifle. And some of us had 45s, your TO weapon. Tell us about uh, looking across a stretch of land and seeing guys shooting back at you. Well, the, you know, uh, you got a good point here because you rarely saw the enemy. I mean, you see, there were incoming rounds of, you know, this and that, of shells and bombs. And we had more problems with the air raids at night than we did with the frontline combat troops. Because we'd lay up our lines and we'd come back and behind a little way. But the evenings were the ones where the, we had to be careful of. Because every night they'd come in with their planes from these various other islands, of course, trying to get our ships and this and that. Where were they coming from? Well, they're coming from Okinawa, they can, and they're coming from, well, that was the next big move, Okinawa, and, or if they had some carriers out, they could come in from the, with their carriers. We hadn't destroyed them all yet, except at Midway, we got rid of four of them, but they had plenty of carriers mm -hmm. at that time. So your ultra took uh, hits from, uh, from bombers at night, that kind of thing? Yeah, that was, a, that was basically what was happening for us. I mean, we were... We were not a regular line company unit. We just up there keeping our lines open. And of course, when there's an air raid, you, know, you have no choice. It's very, it gets very democratic. Everybody <laughs> gets bombed. <laughs> yeah. That's right. <laughs> very, very good, John. Very democratic. <laughs> Everybody gets a piece of the action. <laughs> Guys in your outfit uh, were killed. No, we didn't lose any. We didn't lose any anybody in my outfit killed. I think there may have been a couple of wounded, but it, it was not in a situation where there was hand-to-hand -hand combat. On any typical day when, when you're involved here, um, tell us what you did. You, you, you spoke before about a mile of, of wire. Did you have to go out and lay this wire? Oh, yeah, you go out and lay the wire. And, uh, Are you under fire? No, not so much under fire, no. We, we had an opportunity to lay it when they, things were secured. and. Uh, Walk and lay the thing, and then it was something would happen. Somebody'd like a piece of wire, it was just nice, and cut it out, you know, and tie up something, and we'd have to go out and repair it. That was the extent of it. What was your rank at this time? Corporal. I made corporal you, you out made of telephone corporal school. Already? Out of telephone school. That's pretty fast for the Marine that, Corps. That is. <laughs> Some guys would go 30 <laughs> years before they. Well, usually uh, the old Corps, they had a uh, hash mark, one up and one down, used to call it. Corporal would have two hash marks, Sarge would have three. <laughs> <laughs> what would, would you rather, let's see if I can phrase this correctly, you're on Saipan, it, which, and the second and fourth took horrendous casualties there. Um, would you rather have been doing something else rather than the phone business? Would you rather have been a, a, a Infantry man. Most of us, most of us did really, and we're still the young guy. We still wanted to get into it more so than we did in in World War II. Of course, of course, Korea is another story, but that comes later. Well, you and I talked about this um, before the interview, so let's get to that point because we, di I didn't want to lose it. Uh, one of the questions we ask you later on is, what was your feeling about? the people you were up against. Now here you're on Saipan against the Japanese. In Korea, you're against the Chinese and the North Koreans. Mm -hmm. Tell us how you would measure your opponents. Well, I'd, I'd measure the, in fact, I could put all three of them and lump them to, together, really, uh, as a uh, tenacious and savage fighters what they were. Well, I mean savage. They had no regard for human life. Because when you're in combat, especially in Korea, you, you have to uh, 
subhumanize the pe the, your enemy. He does the same to you. I have no, I had no animosity against a person. I had no, really, I wasn't actually angry with anyone personally. But we're both fighting for a principle. And the uh, the North Korean army was was a good was a good army because they had been taught under the Japanese since 1910 until we took it in 1905. We took it back. But the South Korean army was was not that great. We didn't give them enough stuff to stop that invasion. Now you're coming into the uh, Chinese when they entered the war, which to me was a, was a poor soldier, a poor conscript. He had poor equipment and poor everything. And that's why they lost so many people. They didn't have any air power. They didn't have any artillery or tanks. They just mass, as they say, hordes of Chinese. I always wondered how many Chinese are in a horde. I could never figure that one this out. This was the human wave of yeah, taxis. Right. Okay, we'll get to that. But when the you Japanese to were, uh, they, uh, they operate under the uh, code of the uh, warrior, the Bushido code. Now, the best thing that they can do in their life as a military man is to die one way or another. Either they were killed or they would take their own life. Because to be captured, this is why they treated us so badly when they captured us. The worst thing they can do is to be captured. That would go right back to their ancestors and back, 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 dishonor everybody by being captured. This is why they treated our prisoner, any prisoner, with terrific malice. You were nobody to them. The prisoner was the worst thing. You should, we'd kill you just as look at you, which they did you know, in the Bataan Death March in those places. Geez, I don't, I don't know uh, if, if we want to rank these things, but if, if you put them down one, two, or three, um, do you feel the Japanese were the most ferocious? I would do that. The Japanese were the, were the uh, worst of the bunch, you might say. Uh, they were, uh, they say, uh, very tenacious and uh, savage-like. Well, they they, they, they uh, could have given up a lot of times, and they yeah. wouldn't. You finished the island, and you had maybe eight prisoners yeah. out of the whole bunch. How long were it? Saipan was a long campaign. How long? Well, the actual campaign was twenty-five days, but we spent yeah. nine months there. And uh, from there, we left for Okinawa. Let me ask you if about air support or naval support while, while we're still on uh, mm -hmm. active in Saipan. What what was flying over your head? And what was the it zero? Doing? The zero and the Betty bomber, the two engine bomber, made by Mitchell Beachy. What about uh, American aircraft? Well, we had the uh, had the Corsair, the P sixty P sixty three night fighter and the P P-61 Lightning, and some B-25 bombers we had at, that, at, at the beginning of the uh, operation. Was uh, at least the Corsairs, did you get close in support from them? Did they bomb in front of you or strafe in front of you? Or? The Marine Corps is noted for its close air support. We used to say when the empties drop on us in the front lines, that's close. If we have our and the Marine Corps has, is an autonomous group. It has its own everything, own air, air, air wings, motor transport, uh, uh, hospital corps, and this and that. We're all, we always have it right there with us. We don't have to wait and get, a, get, a, get an okay from some other higher up to do things. We, we're right there. They are, I mean, that saved a lot of it, a lot of, a lot of lives, that close air support. As a, a communication person or a guy on a phone, did you call in support? We, we didn't call in, but the people in the field called in, but they called in with radios. They were uh, tactical air support people who would call it in. How about naval ships? You mentioned battleships yeah, before. Well, they had the, uh, what they called the uh, LC-5, I believe, was the grasshopper that, that, that spotted for the battleships. They'd fly in and have them register their 16 inches and then let them go at that. And they could fire those things about 20 some miles. What was Saipan like in June, July, and August of, uh, what was the climate? Hot, hot and, and uh, muggy. Things uh, had a tendency to rot. Uh, dengue fever was, was rampant there. That's sort of a, uh, dengue fever and impentago. Impentago was a rash type that 
comes out on your skin, which is it's treatable. Dengue fever, you get you get uh, very weak and you ache all over, but that's treatable also. About three days in sick bay and a lot of grapefruit juice. Grapefruit juice. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> what with, were the clothing, the uniforms, anything that the Marine Corps gave you by way of equipment, good, bad, or indifferent? The guys from Attu and Kisco froze to death because the boots were wrong. Yes. What about you? Well, in the, in the Pacific, we had excellent equipment. We had the boots, the dungarees, the jacket, and caps, and it was no problem with cold weather there. In fact, most of us ran around in shorts after everything is over, and uh, uh, you know, caps. We weren't fully dressed for combat at all the time. It was just after the battle is over, you get ready for the next one. Clothing was excellent. How about your leadership? Uh, can you just tell us what we had good leadership because all the people in our organization I was in a signal company were people who had something to do with radio or or, or uh, hotline construction or telephone construction when back in the states before they came in the Marine Corps so we had we had the right right officers of course we had some old timers uh, gunnies and uh, master sergeants were that were just like we were but they had put so, put so much time and but knew the knew the score on, on communications we did a lot of repair work on radar and and radios that came into us but overall no our officers were in line all right how about you or others that required medical care um, can you speak as to the quality of it well the only medical care that I ever received it needed was when I had uh, dengue fever which was three days in sick bay that was in fact that was on Okinawa but it, other than that if, if we go to Korea that would be another story on medical care okay we'll get to yeah. that uh, in a few minutes any of your closest friends with you uh, in combat there on Saipan no I only only uh, only friends we had. We made, it was a new organization. A new unit was just just uh, uh, established. We were all new in the game in that in that company. But we, we were together for two years, which you get to know people. In fact, I'm going to go to a reunion uh, in September. It'll be about ten ten fellows from my company there. So you've stayed in touch over the years. No, so sort of stay in touch. But then they yeah. we have a reunion. We all see each other, and we yeah. don't see each other again for another year or whatever. You've been to these reunions? Yes, sir. What do you talk about? You know, it's uh, we talk about the organization. We find out a lot of things that we didn't know what was going on then, about what was going on, who was this and that and where and why. But after a while, it's, uh, that, that gets kind of old. I mean, we all were there for two years. We all knew what we were, each one was doing. It wasn't something that, well, geez, I got to get to the reunion because I want to talk about the, the war again. No. I mean, we talked it out. But a lot of times you hear the same story, but it gets more colorful each time. It gets expanded or it's inflated. It's like walking to school. It gets further away every year. When you were on Saipan, did you have any anything to do with Tinian? Tinian, you can see, is only a couple, three miles away. I, I didn't go over. Some of our company went over there for some re various reasons, but I never, never left Saipan. We had the B-29. That's where the B-29s came in eventually, mm -hmm. Saipan, Tinian. That was something to see. Well, that uh, the Enola Gay and the others left out of there, and that's a yeah, very that, historic that ground. Yeah. Can you tell us, a, this is an odd question to ask a guy with the, the ribbons you have, but what was your greatest problem in, in, in combat, your greatest challenge? Hey, the greatest challenge in combat is staying alive. That's, that's about the size of it. I mean, usually you're with other people. You're, you're not, rarely are you ever alone or things can get to you, but if you're, you're with your own company or your platoon or this and that, you know, staying alive is the, is the main thing. I mean, of course, through your training and this and that, you don't try not to do foolish things. But that's the best I can do on that. I mean, we're not, you're not thinking about your girlfriend back home or you're this or you're that or anybody. It's not the movies. 
This Did you hook up with anybody who was looking after you? Uh, that We've had uh, men in here that talked about a mentor, uh, somebody who took care of them, or at least told them how to get your head uh, s to stay on for the rest of the day. Did you feel that uh, someone gave you good advice somewhere along the line? Well, our good advice came from the, uh, the DIs in boot camp, who were fellows from most of them from a lot of them from Guadalcanal and in telephone school, a lot of them were, mm -hmm. were had seen combat. And those people, that's how we listened to them. But once you get over there, I mean, it wasn't like a guardian angel on your shoulder or anything. It, we all knew enough. It's all common sense, really. I know fellows and, and, and officers that would, would break out the book and this and that. We'd, they'd say, hey, so first thing you want to do in combat is throw that book away. You know, the ma field manuals on this and this and that and what the enemy, you, you don't know what the enemy is going to do. You don't know where he is. Can you give an ex example of common sense? <laughs> All right, but I have to go to, uh, I have to go to uh, Korea for that one. This was in a combat zone and we were out fixing a line. The line had been destroyed. There were three of three us in the Jeep. Uh, driver, a guy with a shotgun, and myself. No, it's four of us. And the guy with the shotgun, they'd stay with the Jeep. We found the break. And at that time, we, a flare went off. Now, this fellow that was with me was a reserve. I mean, it wasn't, he didn't really know because he hadn't had the training. He said, let's go, let's go, let's run, let's get out of here. He says, freeze right where you are. That's all the enemy wants to see is someone running and flying, and then you will have it. So we just waited, the flare died down, and, and then we walked out of there. That's a that, very that, good example. You know. Yeah. You told us a moment ago that you stayed uh, on Saipan for nine months and then sailed directly to Okinawa. That's, that's correct. Which was um, April 1st of 45. Easter Sunday and April yeah. Fool's Day. Yeah, all of that together. Um, it's 350 miles below the Japanese mainland, so you're getting close to uh, where the, the ultimate uh, effort here. Tell us about Okinawa. Did you go ashore on the 1st? Well, the Okinawa, we went, we went ashore a little earlier because First, the division went in. We had, this, we had two Marine divisions there, 1st Division and 6th Division, plus the 27th and a few Army divisions that, that was, were there. And we, were to, we went ashore. The, the basic plan was we're going to hit the center of the island well and take a few months to get the northern part. Well, we hit the center of the island. We couldn't find any Japanese. They went all the way up north. No Japanese. They came back. And the, upper, the, the, the brass thought, God, if, did they escape? Did the Japanese get off of this island? And we had a flotilla there, a fleet you wouldn't believe. And we started to head south. And then we ran into 110,000 dug in around Naha and this, this and that. It took 82 days. That's the capital that, city. That's the capital city. Yeah. You can see, you can see Buckner Bay out there and the battleships out there. It took them 82 days to take that island. And we had air raids every night. This was the last stand for the Japanese. This is where the kamikaze comes in. Stop right there, because that's where I want to go for a minute. You talked about looking out and seeing the greatest flotilla ever assembled on the face of the earth. The Navy lost 34 ships sunk, 368 damaged, 9,000 casualties. That's right. Four times what were killed at Pearl Harbor. And yet, people look at the at the land battle, and they don't think much. Tell us about these planes over your head. What's well, interesting? They come in um, in the evening. You could, you could almost set your clock by, you might say. But once in a while, they'd come in low. It'd, it'd be our, 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 a, a experienced pilot would come in low because your radar only hits so far above the surface. I don't know what it's 100, 200 feet. You can't detect anything. But well, they'd come in. And of course, if it was early evening, you could watch them. And if it was in the evening when it was dark, they'd come in and you'd hear the, the sirens going, and you'd hear this, this uh, announcement flash red, control yellow. It means it's a, the planes are on the way. 
And then when they got over ahead, these searchlights would go up. The radar was excellent. They, that light would go on and they have a plane right in the lights. But he was, he was so far up, he wasn't going to do much damage. But then the ones, the, the, the ones that wanted to get in on it, they'd come down, in, come down low. Of course, we had no, no people in the air at that time at night. I mean, the ships are all firing, and the Army anti-aircraft are firing. They're knocking them down. And one night there, we were on the beach. Our organization was, was just a little bit off the beach. We just dug in there. And this Jap plane came right over. I could have hit that thing with a, with a rock. It was that low. And I said, there's an experienced pilot, Japanese pilot, because he knew enough to stay low. The radar, and the, you couldn't traverse your guns that low. You could, but you'd be hitting your own people. But well, he got away all right, very from us. And, uh, and then one night, uh, they were so uh, fanatical, they had two planes came in, two transport planes, weren't even camouflaged, wheels up, the lights, we had the lights on them. They were real, of course, they got under radar. They weren't over 100 feet off the ground. They landed those planes, wheels up on the, on the, on the Kadena airfield. And out of those planes were all these suicide troops, Japanese. All they used was grenades. And they, did they, you see this? I saw the planes come in. You did. And they land on the field, and the, and the next day they they killed every one of the Japanese. There must have been about fifty, but w they did manage to damage ten, fifteen planes that were on the runway, just throwing grenades all over. And then there was a night a twin-engine Betty bomber came in, I and mean, you could hear that thing come in. He was low. But this pilot didn't know there was a 90 millimeter Army Anti Aircraft Company right behind ours, and they hit that thing square, squarely. And all it was just one big ball of orange flame. Kaboom! Yeah. Because they had, they didn't have, uh, their their planes were good, but they didn't have any protection on them. No self shielding gas tanks or armor protection for the pilots. It's just that was it. They figured that there was a hundred thousand Japanese on that island mm -hmm. and they had bunkers uh, some of them uh, they discovered later with a hundred and sixty feet underground what I did you see of the enemy How, what did you see of, of uh, troops in the distance or near you or uh, signs that they were there well when we got when we, where we were we had all the, the infantry had already taken it there weren't any Troops running around, except we'd find found the dead ones now and then, and and uh, maybe a couple would come finally give up. But other than that, we didn't get that close to them, except for just for the air raids and the uh, and the watch the. Uh. Well, one morning a plane came in, and I, we always wondered where he came from. But he came from the island of Iwo Shima, where uh, uh, Ernie Pyle was killed. Mm -hmm. Now, Iwo Shima is a small airstrip. Now this morning about eight o'clock we were digging in our switchboards, about eight nine o'clock. I heard this plane. I happened to look down at the end there, past the island. We're near the beach, and I see this plane come in. I mean, this fellow takes no evasive action whatsoever. He's not over 500, 700 feet off the off the water coming in, and he's going to go right after the ship. Well, he didn't drop a bomb. He didn't do a thing, and. Uh, Next thing you know, you got four Corsairs coming off the airfield, which we could see. Each one took a pass and shot them down right there. But this fellow, I think he just wanted to die. He just kept his plane on an even keel and he just shot him down. A Japanese plane. That's, that's unusual, isn't it? It is. I'm going to use the term plum rains, mud, typhoon. Uh, tell us about Okinawa. Well, we uh, we were heading for Japan. Uh, I think it was around the middle of uh, September. In fact, we were all packed to go aboard, and this typhoon hit. In fact, I think the Navy lost eight or nine ships. It didn't blow our tents away, but I mean that that was something. The, the rain and the mud and the oh, gee, it was I mean. Uh, the thing, the good part of it was that we were only there another week, and then we just left. But they were they after the storm went after through. After the storm took, it, we uh, had to uh, delay the thing for about a week till the Navy got organized again. I I neglected to ask you: Were you still attached to the second or fourth, or were you now in the first division? 
On Saipan, was, we attached the second no, and fourth, Okinawa. and Okinawa was the first and sixth we were with. Okay. Um, part of your credentials uh, is that you went to China. Did you have uh, any say in that? Did you volunteer to go to China? No, no, our whole outfit went to China. It was, see, the bomb had been dropped August second, August 6th and 9th, the two bombs were dropped. Yeah. Well, before, if they, they hadn't dropped the bomb, we were slated for Japan. We were going to Japan for the invasion. But once the bomb dropped... It Let's stick with that a second. Okay. Uh, did you know where your target was in Japan, where your outfit was supposed to go? No. We didn't know where our target was. But you knew you were going group. to Japan. That was, that was going to be it. Okay, the bomb came, and then you guys went up to China. That's right. Uh, is this to round up Japanese in China? Uh, of course, the Japanese surrendered. They had controlled China, and we, would, our uh, organization and our troops, we took the city of of Tinsen unopposed. We took the surrender because we put troops in uh, Tinsen, Tsingtao, Peking, and one other place, and we t accepted all the the Japanese surrendered. They weren't going to fight us. It was quite a ceremony. Where and did you go specifically? We went to Tinsen, China. We were there, and they made the surrender. We take taken over the surrender, and also to strengthen Chiang Kai-shek's troops. He was in no position to control China when the war ended, because he's fighting the communists. Now he's going to fight fighting the Japs. Now the communists again. And we left a lot of a lot of equipment there: tanks, guns, BARs, rifles. And going back, we the Chinese, our friends at that time, but when we were in Korea. We got he used those weapons against us. What did you and your outfit do specifically in China? Same work. We kept the. We had switchboards and uh, a little more, more, uh, a lot uh, uh, better switchboard, more complicated, almost like a civilian thing. And we were just in control. We were a, a, um, a control center. All our line, people would call us, and we would direct them to other places. The general would call in, give me. Uh, just in that outfit, yes, sir. Here you go. You know, just hook them up that way. It was uh, just you might call us uh, permanent personnel troop. We were there as a show of force mainly. I mean, we weren't doing any. We had problems with the communists though. There at that time. What kind of problems? Well, we had to lighter in our equipment up from the uh, ships. They bring them into the uh, Taku Bar, and every so often we had to run a, uh, our trucks down there to pick up supplies. Which and is guys, 28 miles. People are stealing your stuff there, I remember. Oh, they uh, steal it, surely. Yeah. But yeah. then the commies would, would open fire sometimes on our, on our uh, trucks and this and that. General Rocky was there, and he got a little bit uptight about it, so he sent out a mortar squad one day, and he just almost leveled a small village where they were. We had a few killed and this and that. They were, and the Chinese soldiers were all over the place. They had their gun emplacements by the bridges and this and that. It would be nothing to go into a, of course, we had a lot of liberty, you know, four or five hours at a time, going to these little uh, restaurants and bars and this and that, you know, enjoying ourselves after 18 months on the rock. You know, we were kind of Asiatic. It'd be nothing for a Chinese squad to come in and round up somebody sitting at a table. There were civilians there, too. Take them out. Just take them out. They weren't going to kill him, but they, they knew he was, he was probably a communist sympathizer or some political person. How old were you then? Let's let's say you're 20, 22, something. You're a kid I'm from I'm 21 Cleveland. years old in China on my you're, birthday. Yeah, you're a kid from Cleveland, and now you're in China. <laughs> you've been to Okinawa, you've been to Saipan, you've been to the Hawaiian Islands. What did you think of all this? Well, the way I used to, the way I put the whole thing, we grew up in a hurry. We, there's so many years in there that the kids today have. They have when they're out of high school. They got a certain routine of dating and this and that and parties and this and having a lot of fun. We didn't. We there was a time in our life was just lost. I mean, you're going right from the having a, a you know a cookout somewhere to eating sea rashes and K rashes in a foxhole. I mean, this is quite a thing. But you know, we were young enough, we took it in stride, really. I mean, I don't know if anyone are really uptight too much about it. We just, this was our thing to do. We did it, we came back. <coughs> we went to school, we got married. We were very local, I mean, very, not, not vocal at all, uh, as far as what the uh, 
when we thought of the war and this and that. We just knew we won the war. That was it. How long were you in China? Three months. We were the first troops in. And what's the time now? Uh, I know it's, you uh, we got into China October 1st of 1945, and we left uh, China uh, January 6th of 1946. The only reason we left, we had enough points built up. You're on your way home then. You've sure. been overseas a long time. You've been in combat. Yeah. Um, where did they? Where did you, did you go from China? Sail right home. We do. Well, we sail. Yeah, we sail right to um, San Diego. <laughs> we sailed nonstop. Yeah. Wow. We had a small carrier, the Matanikov, CVE, an escort carrier. And you're Took on your way home. On, on our way home. Um, and, um, so you go back to Cleveland? They took the uh, discharges at the uh, nearest nearest uh, naval station, which was Chicago, Illinois. I got discharged from Chicago. Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Uh, yeah. yeah. Discharged in February of '46. Mm -hmm. You're out of the Corps. What do you do then? What, what, what did you do? You know, we just, we, my brothers were all home and we were just, uh, what are we going to do? What, this and that. And well, I was with the phone company, I was with the, with the uh, telephone people in the service, and I applied and went to work for AT&T in the Long Lines Division, which put me on the road a lot with these different uh, in construction gangs. And my w other brother became a bricklayer, and another brother. The young brother stayed out about a year, and he decided he's going back in the Navy, so he went back in for 22 years, so that, that took care of him. Yeah. But <laughs> <laughs> certainly did. But I was with the phone company for the th three, four years I was out, which and my climbing and everything helped out. Uh, and um, schooling, wife, family? Uh, nothing at that time, no nothing wife, at nothing. That, time. that comes later. <laughs> how did you get back into the Corps? Or how, uh, well, I know I, you, you're talking about Korea. The, there's <laughs> more to the, your story than we've heard. Well, in 1949, we had a small recession in this country, and the telephone company was laying off, laying off people. And I happened to be one of them. And I thought, well, I'm, I never really wanted to get out of the Marine Corps. It was almost like a, a second home, really. Cause I, I enjoyed the Marine Corps life. I liked their, uh, their torrent table of organization and, and everything that goes with it, the military. Some people fight it, which you don't fight it. So I dro dropped, uh, dropped everything and I went back in the Corps, January, Friday the 13th, January 1950. Went down to Camp Lejeune. Didn't have to go to boot camp again. Already uh, Thank <laughs> heaven for that. <laughs> yeah. I know. It. Went down there and what happened on June 25th, we're out on the sunning ourselves, and here we get this word, the, the North Koreans have invaded South Korea. Where were you then? I was, uh, where was I then? Yeah. I was out in the, On that particular day. I was out on the lawn sunning myself. It was a Sunday morning at Area 3 at uh, Camp Lejeune. It was a Sunday, you know, holiday routine. And it, how long was it before you were on a train going somewhere? August. In fact, I was home for my sister's wedding. I just got this 10-day leave, and they called me back from that. I, we got the wedding out of the way, but we got called back, reported immediately back to your base. We got back there, stayed three days, went out, got on a train, and went to San Diego, Camp Pendleton. You'd had some experience in the in the Orient, uh, and had looked at a few maps. You at first, like the rest of us, never had heard of Pearl Harbor. Had you heard of Korea? Uh, that was my next statement. Everybody's yeah. running around. Where the hell is Korea? <laughs> I said, we don't know. So we got, finally got some maps. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. That little thing that sticking little, out there. That little peninsula. Yeah. God. <laughs> You're still doing the same kind of work in the in the Corps? Same thing. It stays right in, uh, in uh, communications. What rank do you have by now? I ended, I ended, well, I went back in as a PFC. 
but I ended up as a tech sergeant this time. They didn't give you back your stripes? Oh, not after four years, no. No. They just gave me the PFC, and I was all right with me. I mean, <laughs> you're with a bunch of new guys now, mm -hmm. I assume. Uh, new guys. A new outfit shaping up to go overseas again. This is. Uh, did tell it. Were you anticipating this happily? Uh, you were going to get some action? Or did you think, God, there's a mess over there? Well, I did. See, I'm, with, I'm, I'm the old guy in Korea, and I'm 25 years old. Now, I'm with the 19 and 20 year olds. Now, I got a few ribbons and this and that from World War II, and, you know, and I'm kind of looked upon for various answers to various questions. Are we talking about this and that? And that? You know, we talk about the war, because they had seen none of it. And what, did, what did the information I could give them as far as what you do? They were, they were kind of leery. I mean, we were all kind of leery. And then when we knew we were going, I mean, it's, listen, we're going back into combat. Of course, they were, these young fellows are good, excellent Marines like we were in World War II. Well, we were good then, too, but we had a little more experience. And, uh, Did the name Douglas MacArthur ring high on your... Not in World War II, it didn't ring too highly. No, but when, you, when, you, when you went to Korea, uh, this is going to be a big, um, important man in your life from here on in. That's end. right. Okay, where did you sail from and to? We sailed out of uh, San Diego to Kobe, Japan is where we went. Mm -hmm. Then there was a typhoon there, and that lasted a couple of days. Then from Kobe, Japan, we went to the Pusan perimeter where the, where the uh, brigade, Marine Brigade had already been there. They got there in August, and we got there in September, just one month apart. Now, you're with a bunch of guys who had been driven down from the 38th mm -hmm. parallel right to this little pocket. That's in right, the, the southern that, part yeah. of the peninsula. Yeah. This, if, if you leave there, you're. you're this in the is ocean. it, it's all over. So, you were into that perimeter uh, under General Amman and the 10th Army? T yeah, Amman, 10th Army, and okay. Walker was 8th was, uh, Corps. Walker Amman was 10th Corps, and yet. Walker was 8th Army. Yeah. Now, did, <laughs> I'm not going to ask, were you comfortable in this situation? But you guys are in a desperate situation. Well, when we got there, the, they were bringing the Marines off the line, out of, away from the Nactong. Yeah. They were getting ready for Incheon. We didn't know it until we got there. We stayed one week. All the guys came off, the, all the Marines came out of, out of the uh, Pusan perimeter. General Walker kept his troops there. Now, we spent... Oh, I think it was the 13th, 12th or 13th, about five days in Pusan reorganizing ammo and this and that and being assigned. Now I'm assigned to a whole new outfit. There's the 4.2 field array of telephone man, communicator. Okay, very briefly decide what the Incheon uh, invasion was for the benefit of people who hadn't done their, their reading here. The Incheon landing came off just about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the evening, which is rare for Marines to do an, an evening assault. Uh, Usually we're out that's, there in, that's in the morning. That's because of the tides. Exactly. The yeah. tide was a, it was a stroke of genius of, on MacArthur's part. They didn't think he could do it. But we executed it so beautifully that it made him really look good. You know, the Marines hit that beach. We went in, they say, between 5.30 and uh, 6. It was a four-man uh, forward observer team. You know, we had 10 North 10 South Koreans with us, with a ride shotgun, I guess. So we, hit, we come into the beach, tide is high, we're passing a couple of destroyers that are firing and the Corsairs are overhead and that beach is just, just darkened with, you know, with smoke. And they're firing at us, but they didn't use mortars or they would have gotten some of us. If the, the shells that they were firing must have been from a tank because they were hitting behind us. Anyhow, we, the coxswain put the, the little landing ship, the little Higgins boat, LCVP, he laid it right up against the wall. Now, each ship had a, one of these ladders and in case the tide was too low or you couldn't get in. But ours, we got in such a high tide, I just stepped on the gunnel of the, of the landing craft and stepped right over the wall, right onto the beach with the rest of us. And we went about 50 f feet or so, hit the deck and I'm lying there and some guy tapped my foot in the eye and he says, he says, uh, how you doing? I s and it's funny what you think of. 
I said, I'm doing fine. They said, but Okinawa was never like this. In Okinawa, we just walked ashore. And then there's a part of a wall there, and there's a marine that was back to the, to the wall, and he just hollers over me. He says, hey, fellow. He says, my buddy got hit right where you are. So I just rolled over and rolled up, come up next to him. And then we reorganized, and we had the, our objective was this hill that was in front of us. I mean, we're not alone. There are Marines around. And our objective was to get up on top of that hill. There's an observation post, run a wire back to the guns, and register the guns, and then we're all set in case of a counterattack. Were you under fire when you went out to uh, lay this wire and do this kind of uh, work? No, the sergeant and I stayed at the top of the hill, and, we, and two wiremen went back and laid the, laid the line. No, we weren't under fire. It's dark. It's 10 o'clock at night now. But we had the in fact, this hill we went up, we didn't even know who had it until we, we were kind of cautious. Well, who's, we could hear diggings and this and that up there, commotion. We decided, well, who's got this hill? So we said, well, we, when I find out, we're going to have to just go up this hill. Of course, once you start up there, then <clears throat> in the Marine Corps, when it's not like, well, who are you or what are you doing here? You know, the vernacular of the Marine Corps let us know the Marines were there. No. I, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask a backward question okay. here. Um, your overall orders uh, were to run for the Yalu River when, when, when you finally yes, got sir. to this place. Uh, did they t what did they tell you about advancing? To, to go out to a certain point and stop and wait for the uh, the rest of the troops to come ashore. What were your specific orders? No, we had plenty of troops ashore. The, the order was go up, we're going to advance slowly. And was, after a while, we weren't getting any, uh, any opposition from the Chinese, but we were, they were around. And it was far down as Sudan. We mentioned it to the authors of the Chinese won't be coming into this war. They won't be coming into this war. We're walking right through the Chinese. And we're heading up, we're up at this chosen reservoir. We had some people even as far as the, of the, as the Yalu River. But well, that was on November 27th when it... Okay, we're, we're skipping ahead and that's okay because I want to get you up to the Chosun. Okay. But weren't you at Wusan as well? Wonsan. Wonsan, excuse me. Yeah, we, we, me. from Incheon, after we secured no, South Korea in 16 days, we got back on the ships at Incheon, swung all the way around, Operation Yo-Yo on the on the uh, we, uh, east side of, the, of Korea. How long were you on those ships? I was down about a week a on week. that ship. And you went back and forth sailing past the 38th parallel. Back and forth to, yeah. to get rid of it, because they had to clear the mines out of there. There were thousands of mines up yeah. there. So we finally landed, and as it goes, Bob Hope was ahead of us, and they make joke of that. <laughs> it was unopposed, let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> then we got on a little train, is what it was, and got up Oh, we got past Coterie and then into, up into uh, Hagaru, and then we're starting up on the, we're on the, uh, there's a certain amount of action going on, and, and uh, of course the, the Chinese, or North Korea, didn't have any airplanes at that time. The Russian planes were once in a while. I never saw, never saw a Russian plane, they were using jets, but our people could handle those people. And uh, that was when we found out something called the MiG was in the yeah the MiG fifteen was yeah. the first one. I'm going to uh, editorialize here in that you are now on your way up to what I I think of as one of the worst situations the Marine Corps ever got into. Mm -hmm. um, you're on your way up toward the Yalu River. You're you're and you're in a middle of a political situation. MacArthur says there's no Chinese in the war. Right. Uh, General Amon on, um, in the middle of October had talked to Chinese troops that you guys had captured. Yeah. It, the first snow in this area was in November and the Yalu River began to freeze over and you guys are told keep going north, keep going mm -hmm. north and you're walking up toward a place called the Chosun Reservoir. Tell people, you're, you're one of the rare few who were there. Tell us what it was like to be up there. Well, the Chosun Reservoir 
it was interesting because we had just we were on the east side, and and the day before we swung around to the west side of the chosen reservoir because the army was there, and they went back, and the, and the army was on the east on the east side now. So we're up there with the fifth uh, and seventh Marines and some eleventh Marines artillery we have with us. Now it's a nice bright sunny day. It's cold. Uh, but the game plan was, well, we're, we're here, now we're going to continue to go on and on. Now, that night of the tw November 27th, uh, as I recall, there was a firefight on one of the flanks. So we thought, well, it could be certain troops, Chinese troops, maybe just testing our lines to see what was happening. Well, that got into a, a real firefight, and then we had a 50% watch, and then it was now 100% watch. That means everybody's awake. Well, then the word gets down that they've overrun the front lines completely. The four men in our FO team, which I could have been one had I not been on the last one, all four of them were wounded. They weren't killed, they were wounded. And the, the, the um, casualties started to come back. We couldn't fire a shot because our, you might say our eyes and our sights are gone. Our people can't give us any, any registration number, any figures because we can't fire our weapon under so many yards because we'd be hitting our troops. We got to reach out while well, they were right up, right up in the front line with us, you know, hollering, screaming, and bugles and everything else. And then they started bringing the wounded down. And we had a couple of warm up tents. And this corpsman is, was going to give this one uh, wounded Marine a shot of morphine, but it was frozen. So what he had to do was put it in his mouth to thaw out that, that, uh, that uh, uh, morphine to give this little serrets give him a shot of morphine. It's like he'd been hit with a machine gun. In fact, they, the fellows that hit our people were Chinese with Thompson machine guns. They were the ones we left there in 1949 to the nationalists. And of course, the communists took over. And well, the next morning, I mean, we had, we, we had to slowly come back now. Uh, we they laid, in fact, for us, they even laid down smoke so we could come back under smoke. So we haul our, all our gear. Now coming back behind us is a 75 recordless gun company of ours that was overrun by the Chinese. And that's when we thought if the Chinese had used those weapons, they, they were right behind us, maybe 500 yards. They, they could have really devastated us. Well, what happened, the Marines retook this 75 recordless gun company, but the Marines weren't there then because they had moved back. Now what you see, you see a uh, our guns, our 75s there, and you see a, the Chinese exactly where they died. One, one fellow was on the thing, was almost like a statue or some sort of a monument. One fellow was right behind the guns, he was frozen. Another fellow had an ammunition pack, he was trying to put it on his shoulder, frozen. And the rest of them were just, they died and were frozen just as they, as, as, as they were in, the, in what position they were in. It was a grotesque thing. It was almost like a monument, and uh, well, we by, by, by past that, and you know, we held up one night, and we, and we established our line, but we're slowly going back down this road. This is at the point at which Chesty Puller says we're advancing in all directions, which I think is one of the great quotes in Marine Corps. Well, yeah, his idea. Well, we they <coughs> they've surrounded us. Now we got them where we want them. That's they exactly get, right. They can't get away now. O. P. General O. P. Smith is the one that said we're we're not <coughs> we're not retreating. We're advancing in a another direction. Well, he's right because normally if you're going to retreat, you have an avenue of escape, a free avenue of escape where you can just beat it. They weren't going to let us out. The, the Chinese got the word annihilate, especially that first division. The guys with the yellow leggings, they'd call us, the canvas, because they hated us. You had quite a reputation. I'm going to mispronounce something here. The Funchilin Pass, is that it? F yeah, f that's right, Funchilin Pass. Funchilin Pass. When you guys are out coming back down the mountain now, it's December 10th on my records, the bridge was blown. Oh, yeah. And if you couldn't repair that bridge, there's 14,000 of you on the other side mm -hmm. of the bridge. Did you know the bridge was out and that you had a little problem there? Personally, did you know this? 
No, first I didn't know that. I heard about it. We heard okay. about it, but we did, I didn't actually see it. Did you at any time think, I'm in a terrible situation here? Well, that happened when they, we got the word that we were surrounded, and our lieutenant told us, listen, we're surrounded, but we're going to walk out of here. You're going to take your rifle, your bed, your bedroll, and all the char you can carry, and the rest of the stuff you're going to throw away. And you're bringing did. out your dead. And we're bringing out our dead and equipment. Or as, as Colonel, our Colonel Murray said, our 5th Marine Regiment commander, he said, we're coming out here with Marines, we're bringing our equipment and our dead, or we're not coming out. Colonel Murray was a big... I saw him some years ago, big, big strapping yellow fellow. I understand General Lawman of the uh, MacArthur's Army. Psychophant, uh, <laughs> I right. call him. Uh, he came up and told Chesty Puller and, and your officers, abandon everything, yep. I'll get you more. And the Marine Corps said, no, uh, this is our equipment and we're bringing That's it out right. with us. Well, he was doing some funny things over there running around he, he didn't he didn't have a great ep, great reputation as far as we were concerned he, one of these guys was you know co uh, generals of, all of a sudden he, he he handed out all these medals to people here and there and this and that for no reason whatsoever i know some fellows it's a, he gave him when he gave it to the cook you know what am i getting this medal for I, but i mean I, it was just foolish things that were happening and they didn't get along that well with our General Smith didn't get along with our Almond at all. No, I, I, I guess history has shown that. The bridge was your only link to getting back down to the coast. And it, it is, am I correct that they, they flew in by helicopter trusses uh, to put in place? Was it a helicopter or the 119s? Cause they dropped us the stuff to... They needed so many uh, lengths, and they, they dropped an extra one. Span it. It wasn't, it was a treadway bridge, I believe they call it. In the World War II, we called them a Bailey Bridge. Yeah. But this, I believe, was a treadway bridge. And they got them in, and in fact, it was the first engineers that did it. And the commanding officer of the first engineers was my commanding officer in World War II when he took over our, our Seventh Service Regiment, Colonel Partridge, engineer mm -hmm. in his own right. 14,000 guys on a very narrow, winding road coming down the mountain. It's a long parade. Where were you in this? Front, back, middle? No, we, the 7th Marines were ahead of us. We, we came up in the rear, right behind them. There's only the one road. I mean, it was just a matter of... But where were you in this gang of guys? Um, I was near the back with the, with the 4.2s. and. So you were, you were... One of, one of the last ones out? Or? Yeah, we were one of the last ones out. The 5th, 7th Marines were ahead of us. And the Chinese uh, right on your tail? Well, what they would do, you'd have to, uh, they, they set up these roadblocks, like Tuk Tong Pass, so that was an awful one. It was a real, like a hairpin turn. I mean, you, they, they had that zeroed in, and they had a f fight to get through that. And uh, at, uh, at Tuk Tong Pass was, that was the situation, if, they, if they'd have, if they would have captured that area, we'd have never gotten out, because we had to get through that pass. There was no other place we could go. That's when uh, Captain Barber from the Seventh Marines up on the hill got a Medal of Honor, and General Ray Davis, Medal of Honor. He took a bunch of troops up to help him out, and they secured that that when you, area. When you say a pass, I don't have a mental image of it. Um, but I understand the only reason you guys got out is you kept the high ground. You kept the, well. This is it, and on the high, high ground, ground on, on size, on the size of these. How uh, high up? Is there? Are they a mile over your head or? What? Oh no, I don't think a mile over. Maybe, what, three or four hundred meters? This and that. Mm -hmm. you, enough to see the control of the area. But uh, of course, they're trying to knock us off the road. But but they, they of course, they didn't. We lost. Well, in the, in the chosen battle, we lost about uh, 3,000 killed and about 12,000. There were uh, 12,000 wounded and killed. In other words, you had about 3,000 of us that got out of there without a scratch. The rest was either, there were 3,000 dead, and the rest either had wounds or frostbite, which would, took a heavy toll on frostbite. What about you? Um, 
What about your leg? Well, I got back to Hagaroo, that's 14 miles from um, Udamni, which is, which is the part where we were at the Chosen Reservoir. And that next day, the, they came along and said, everybody's going to be checked for frostbite. Now, this was the 5th of December. So I, I had looked at my, my feet and this and that, and they were all blistered in my hand. I had this one finger was black because of the poor equipment we had. And I went in to have a check, and he says, you're through. I thought it was, my, he says, your features, you'll never make it. And he was right. We had 60 more miles to go. He says, you're through. So I put the tag on this and that, and I flew out of there, and they flew out about 4,500 troops out of Hagaru with the C-47s or the DC-3s. And that was on December the 6th, and that was the last day the Marines were there. And they all headed s south again towards Kotori and Chin Hong Ni and those places down to uh, Hung Nam at the, in uh, Ham Hung and then the port. Where did you fly to? Flew to the uh, 118 Shore Hospital in Japan. Is this back at Kobe? Yokosuka. This is at Yokosuka. And it was just loaded with, with wounded and frostbite. And it's interesting, I, I it had something there about the humorous. I, I thought this was kind of humorous. They were trying all kinds of things to combat frostbite after you get it. We weren't too sharp with it. Some people in their feet, they had these little warming tents on the bed, and others were taking shots. Well, I, I got kind of lucky. They were going to try whiskey. Three shots of whiskey a day for seven days. The, the nurse was coming along with a corn and well, somebody's, sermon. Somebody's got to do it. Yeah. <laughs> well, the funny part was, I turned to the rest of the guys in the ward, to MacArthur, to Truman, <laughs> to Sigmund Rhee, to the Marines. <laughs> I don't think it helped. I don't think it helped the frostbite or anything, but it helped my spirits quite a bit. And, and the other guys in the ward. Yeah, Sherman, how do you rate? How do you rate? Uh, well, hey, some got it. What were they able to do for you there, medically? Not much of anything. Um, in fact, for the frostbite is, once you get it in your hands, uh, uh, your hands get real thick. The dexterity is gone. You couldn't just pick up anything like that. You'd pick up with your whole hand. I remember when I started to thaw, I saw these little marks, little stripes in there, and I says, and I realized what had happened. When we, once in a while, we could buy, uh, light a fire. We put our sea ration cans in with the lid open. And I'd pick that thing up and didn't even realize it was that hot. I said, well, it must be cold. But, and it was, that was a scar. You didn't even feel it. And, uh, but the painful part is when they thaw out, when they start. For five days, I couldn't, I couldn't even write. It was so tender. I had a young fellow write a letter home to my mother. I mean, it was just that tender. You couldn't even hold a pencil. You just had a take these, that's all. It, eventually it, it worked out, but it never, you never get over frostbite. Dick, uh, did you not in fact lose part of your leg? Uh, yes, that happened three years ago, and as I just mentioned, it'll, it'll stay with you the rest of your life, and this finally it got to me in um, February of uh, 99. I had this awful ache in the leg and could hardly move, and I finally got to my doctor, and the surgeon got a hold of it, and he said, there's nothing we can do for this. And they had to take the below knee amputation, which I was very fortunate. I mean, I'd seen fellows in the hospitals with fingers gone and both legs gone. I mean, I, I was, I was to say, fortunate enough not to be any worse. But 40 years after the fact, you That's lost it. part of your leg that you had really lost in Korea. Yeah. Now, I would advise any veteran today uh, if you had any contact with frostbite at all and you hadn't contacted the VA, you should do so because this is a, this is a, a condition for a service-connected disability. And a lot of them didn't do it until later on in life. Well, it was, I feel a little cool, a little this and that. But this came off in, while I was in the core, the finger. But As a result of the frostbite? Yeah, yep, both of them. Of course, the frostbite we, we, we got, the, it was so rampant because we had lousy equipment. 
We had shoe packs that weren't any better than what I used to use when I used to go hunting when I was a kid back in Ohio. The leather, uh, it was the uh, rubber bottoms and the high top boot type thing, nice and tight, no circulation. You couldn't, couldn't change your socks. You had no chance to change the socks and trying to warm them up any. And the pockets were too big and too heavy. And the, the gloves were useless. I mean, I'm trying to splice a wire with gloves on. Bob Dunbar, your cameraman, knows that. How you, you can't do it. It only takes a few seconds, and that 30 below zero to affect your hands. And of course, as soon as we leave Korea, they get the beautiful shoe packs things. They're good for 40 below zero, and flak jackets, and gloves, and mittens. And Too late. Too late. That's right, yeah. four or 5,000 people. Where did you go from Japan? Japan went to um, Triple General Hospital in the Hawaiian Islands for one day. We're just making leapfrog is what it is. And into uh, Oakland, Mare Island, there was a hospital there during the war for a couple of days. And then from there, you were shipped to your nearest hospital to your home. Of course, I'm back at uh, Great Lakes Naval Station at the hospital there for about three months in that hospital. It took about, and they were trying everything to save the finger, but it wasn't, it just wasn't that good. That great. Well, they finally made a couple of a couple of cuts on it, but it never really healed. And I went on for two more years, embassy duty in Mexico. When I came back to be discharged, I checked into the hospital and I said, "We have to do something about this finger," which they said, "Okay." So that took another couple of months with all kinds of other treatments and this and that. Nothing was working. So they decided they had to take it off, and I said, well, that's fine. I said, it's only in the way now. You're walking around with a finger, the bulbous thing, and tender. So, you know, they took it off, and I said, geez, that's fine with me. Don't skip over Mexico. It's unusual to talk to a Marine who was... Uh, no, it wasn't Veracruz. <laughs> You were at Veracruz? No, no, I, well, I, no I'm only kidding, but the no. Marines were in Veracruz 1914, but... When I was at a guard company in Crane, Indiana, Indiana Naval Ammunition Depot, and the word came out they're looking for embassy people. You had to have two years to do it, and you had to be an NCO. <clears throat> I was a sergeant at that time. So I applied and made it, went down to Washington, D.C., and the whole world was open. All the capitals were open, 1952. Paris, London, whatever you wanted. So I have to, I have to hold out for Moscow. You know, everything else is taken, Moscow. So two of us holding out. And the captain says, I can't, I need one guy. I can't figure out which one of you two I, I'll send. Let's take a test. Well, we took a test. Still can't figure it out. So he calls us in one day, both of us. He said, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to flip this coin. <laughs> and this is so, I lost. You, yeah, you, well, maybe. <laughs> well, you're right, too. And I, I lost that. So <clears throat> a couple of days later, we're having inspections we do every day. The captain's coming by, and he says, uh, Hey, Sermon, how would you like to go to Mexico City? we got a couple of openings down there. We need a man down there. We need a senior NCO. So we're sending two guys down there. I said, I'll take Mexico City. Yeah, right. You know, no uniforms, excellent duty. Don't drink the water. Forget the war. <laughs> <laughs> so three days later, I'm on the way to Mexico City. How long were you there? Just about two years. Guarding the embassy? Is that well, in embassy security. There was always a Marine in the embassy, at least two. Of course, they closed. There was always someone there. And during the day, we, were always, we hand out passes, and we do various other duties just to make sure that everything is fine. If they have any problems, they call us. Our little weapon was a, we had civilian clothes, we carried a little 38, concealed naturally. Bill O'Dwyer was our ambassador, terrific man. And uh, in the evening, we'd go through every floor. Of course, it didn't take that long, and we're looking for any kind of uh, confidential, restricted confidential or top secret material. It would say right on it, top secret, restricted, confidential. If it were found lying on the desk, I think we'd pick it up, write up a citation. And the next morning, that person had to go up to the security officer's 
office and pick up that piece of equip piece of material that was classified and explain, you know, just why are you leaving stuff like this out? Now, if we really want to get somebody, not that we really want to get somebody, we'd look in the wastebasket. In that time, carbon paper was big. We'd take the carbon paper and hold it up to the light and see, uh, dear, we dear got mother, you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 we didn't, I mean, it was something we wanted to, if we wanted to be that <clears throat> tough about it. But, uh, Normally, whatever. Or a safe might be open, or a fire room door might be open. We had certain combinations. You have to call people in. And uh, tourists down there, if they got into, into any trouble, they'd call the embassy. And we always had a protection officer on duty. You know, they were out, got into trouble, or the bill got padded. For some strange reason, they got into the, into the problems with the local police, and they'd call us. and. We'd have to help them out. That sounds like pretty good duty. It was excellent duty. In fact, I, that's where I met my wife-to-be. Really? Yeah, she was in Foreign Service. She was in USIS, United States Information Service. And I made some good friends down there, which I keep in touch with today. That's good. It, was that, uh, that it for you in the Corps? That did it. I came you back came and um, they said before the uh, I, the finger wasn't right, so I checked in at Bethesda Naval Hospital in Washington, where I was discharged, and uh, stayed there a couple of months, and they finally, I guess he took it off, and that was the end of the Corps for me. It's interesting, I have a daughter in the, in the Navy, of, <coughs> she's a full commander, she's in the Nurse Corps, she's stationed at Bethesda now, and she was in the Gulf War. And I'd go down there once in a while. And, but where, where is she right now? She's at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Oh, too bad. I'd say bring her up here. We'd love to uh, interview her. I was her. talking to her. She was here the last w a couple of days. But, you know, if she'd tell you about the Gulf War. If you, she was on the hospital ship Comfort. Mm -hmm. and that was something. When and where were you d uh, discharged? At um, Washington, D.C., Henderson Hall. At w at, with what rank? A tech sergeant? Tech sergeant. A tech sergeant. You jumped in ahead of time a little bit before and thought about a humorous experience. Um, you've had a long ride in the Marine Corps and a, a wonderful one to places that uh, were tough to be in. In all that, can you tell us a most, most memorable experience in your Corps history? Well, the most memorable experience uh, was in World War II. And that was first, I met my brother on Okinawa, who I, had, who I hadn't seen for two and a half years. He was in the Army. And we got together on Okinawa for a couple of months. I hadn't seen him for two and a half years. And the, the second incident was, uh, and I mentioned, was the uh, dropping of the two uh, atomic bombs. Those you don't forget. That was, that, that's where the two uh, that that Two kept things you that, from yeah. the invasion. Korea, there was, right, yeah. oh, I mean, the Korea, all the incidents coming back, you, you stay there, but these were the big. How about a memorable character over, over the, all those years? Did some guy stick out that you remember? Well, this goes back to World War II also. The <clears throat> most memorable character I remember, I never met her, but it was Tokyo Rose. We used to listen to her evening. She'd have the she had better music. She had all of the Glenn Miller records, the big band stuff. And she'd come in. She had a nice voice, you know, a nice, nice voice. Young, young girl. She'd come in, and then she'd... <laughs> I remember on Oakland, uh, Saipan, it was 4th of July, coming up. She'd get on the, on the horn and... We are going to celebrate the 4th of July for you people. We're going to send in a, a thousand heli... A th no, a thousand paratroopers. I said to myself, I don't think Japan had a thousand parachutes, because I don't think their pilots wore any parachutes. We're going to send in a thousand paratroopers. We're going to show you a real celebration. Of course, it never came about. And then she'd get on and talk to the married guys and, this, and the young guy. Oh, you guys, your sweethearts, uh, what are you, uh, you're over here fighting the war for these guys, and all the four Fs are out with your girlfriends and, and wives and everything. Well, I mean, it was hilarious because, well, 95% of us were single anyhow. I mean, it, it didn't, it was just, it just, it, of course, it was kind of bad for, I think there were more divorces in World War II than anything because you're out there so long, a couple of years, 
nice guys too that wound up in divorce courts with the other wife. The dreaded. But they that. Were uh, yeah. But that it was that was the the person I remembered. In fact, she was a t uh, a um, American citizen. She got caught over there in 1940. Went over to see a, a sick aunt, and they kept her. The war broke out in 41. Oh, went over in 41. She graduated from UCLA. And she had they to get a job somewhere. Yeah, yeah, she had to have a job. So yeah. <laughs> MacArthur exonerated her. They were going to try her for treason, but they did give her a few months in a few years in prison. But other than that, no, she did more for our morale than than anything. It was just she did, <laughs> totally unintended. I'm yeah, sure. Yeah, let's have the music. Rosie, <laughs> did you join a reserve unit after you came home? No, or that that was it. Finally, no, I didn't. I didn't join yeah. anything. Did you join any veterans organizations? Yeah, the DAV. You, you look like you're uh, VFW. Prime to go somewhere. Yeah, VFW and Legion. Not that I, I'm only active in the DAV and the um, and the Chosen Few organization. That's our organization of the the Korean uh, War. That's the guys who were up at the reservoir with yep. you. Yeah. What kind of reception f did you get from the people, your family and friends, when you came home from Korea, get out of the core? Well, the uh, coming home from um, coming home from Korea was well. It wasn't bad because the war, like I said, I had about two and a half years away from the war. Mm -hmm. But uh, com when I was coming home, I came home from Mexico. Of course, in Washington D.C., I was discharged. But it, it was it was hairy but during the war is what it was. We get these letters from your folks back home. Some of the, of course, the media really plays it up. They had the first Marine Division annihilator at one time. And we weren't annihilated. We were kind of ruffled, but we weren't annihilated. <laughs> and the stuff that they read in the paper and the pictures they put in, in fact, I saved a lot of them. But but it was it, they were just they never thought we'd make it. The other friend of myself went in at the same time in the Korean War. They never thought we'd make it, what they heard. And when we came home, I tell you, we were like a couple of gods. Like we couldn't, of course, we're in uniform. And we, of course, we're still single. You know, we're still having a good time. You go to a place, a restaurant. And I went to, a, went to a little place one time, this fellow and I, we were a bunch of guys there. And there was a, stra a table over there, and they asked the waiter if they, those two Marines would come over. They just wanted to meet somebody who was in the Chosen Reservoir battle. Well, I mean, you bet. This, this was something. I mean, what better could you ask for, really? I know. That's, you know, uh, that's the equivalent and, and, and of And when I think what they did to the Vietnam boys. God. Well, okay, let's, let's go right into that. What do you feel about the reception the uh, the guys got from coming home from Vietnam? I think they got a, a very very raw deal on the whole thing, uh, and there were plenty of people responsible for that. Not necessarily, well, the politicians were the responsible. That war could have been won easily if they had let General Westmoreland and the military handle that war the way it should have been. The po politics involved in that thing. There was no reason for. The, there's no reason for so many people being annihilated and surrounded in that war when they never even established a front line. And you got people, you got people like General Kerry, when, or uh, uh, Senator Kerry comes back, a hero. He could have done more to help that war than to hinder it. He and Jane Fonda, Ramsey Clark, and the rest of them that were against the war, against the war, against the war. Of course, you're, well now you got the American people half and half against the war and for the war. They should let the generals run the thing, and they would have ended that thing. We did it in Korea. We did, we took all of North Korea back in 16 days. We'd have been up. We could have gone back up to the, the Alu River. And then there's where the politics start again. MacArthur was doing a, a decent job. Of course, he gets fired, and Ridgeway comes in, and then they get their hands tied. I mean, what they said about the, the Vietnam people, they had the best people, they had the best equipment, best food, best of anything that the, the, that a military man wanted at that time. Lots of, not more so than we ever had, even in World War II. But it got out of hand and it, it just, it was just an awful thing that the American, you, that's why very, you, you don't get the Vietnam veteran joining 
anything much, any strength at all. I think we've got a couple in our, our chapter, DAV chapter. But they figured, well, you know, what they said about they, of course, they came back singly, a lot of them, which had, and you get on a plane, go to war, and you get on a plane and come back to, from the yeah. war, which is not a good thing. And all of a sudden, you're just thrown out there again, and it's quite a traumatic experience for these guys. Let's continue this idea just a minute more. Mm -hmm. um, what did you think then, and what do you think now? about uh, uh, your military service, World War II and Korea, you were all gung-ho back in 42, 43, 50s. What do you think about that now? Well, I think about it now, I'm, I'm glad that I was in, to be in any of these two wars, I'm glad I was in World War II and Korea from the way it turned out. In fact, the American people treated us quite well for both wars, even though the Korean War is noted, noted for its forgetfulness. They forgot the Korean War. Well, it's not a forgotten war, it's a forgotten victory, we always said. And uh, other than that, I mean, I, I, I uh, really have no, nothing against the American people, the way they treated us and, and, and the attention we got from World War II and Korea. Yeah. But I'll never, I'll never understand it. American people doing what I, when I say the American people, I says, I say half or the those people who gave the Vietnam veterans just a hard, hard time. They did not rate that because they had the best. So, Dick, we've been at this for ninety minutes. Um, is there anything I haven't asked you? Anything? One last thought that you'd like to leave with us here today. Well, uh, you had one in there about uh, the family and the, and the community and, and the future generations. Uh, but I, the way I look at this whole thing, war is. <clears throat> I was born in 1924, and sent in. The World War I was over, the war to end wars. Now, since my time on this earth, I had World War II, there's was, was was Korea, there's Vietnam, there's Desert Storm, and um, I think, yeah, those four. And this idea that one war is going to stop another war is, is actually a fallacy. We're going to have wars until the end of this earth. Not big ones so much, maybe. Maybe big ones. A lot of little ones, like, uh, like you see. Operation Just Cause and Panama and this and that. But to the, in the families, I'd, I'd like to see families, especially if they have children, let these children know about the wars. That, let them know what it, what it takes to preserve these freedoms. And there's nothing free about freedom. I mean, it's tough to keep it. We have to fight for it inwardly and outwardly from different causes. Now, in the community, what you're doing right now, John, is excellent. And we need more of this. We need to be, have people aware of what we went through and why we went through it. It wasn't just a jaunt, well, we just go to war and have some, you know, do some, have a fun thing out of it. And the, and the, uh, the schools should do more. I think they're doing a little bit more about it. Having veterans come in and talk to their people, and uh, these get the allegiance back in the flag, and get uh, now in churches now you can't even put the flag on a veteran's coffin. I mean I don't understand. <laughs> you no know, church and state is all right. Well, what? The, where's the big calamity with the flag on a veteran's coffin that would fought for all these rights for the rest of the people could enjoy? And then. Uh, this it's aware it has to there has to be more awareness uh, in all areas because and they don't teach much in school I don't think the kids are getting much on anything as far as the wars are concerned I mean it's not it, it it's part of history I mean they'll talk about wars that didn't make a didn't mean a thing to us way back in the Napoleonic Wars and this and that to a point they talk about that but let's bring them up to date there should be certain things that kids should know about. You'd be surprised how many kids you say December seventh, forty-one. 
Well, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, some know. And then, for, as I say, for the future generations, they're going to have to live with the idea that we, we need a strong, strong military. That's the best deterrent I can see. World War II, we weren't even ready. Korea, we weren't ready. We, had, we were better off, I think, in Vietnam, but we didn't utilize it correctly. So the whole picture is, let's have a strong military. Let's keep people aware of what has happened as far as the military is concerned. And, and let's display all this stuff. Let's have awareness to everybody, especially your students, if people are come growing up. A lot of the adults don't know a lot that should know, too. And with that, John, I, that was it. Dick. Well, thank you very much. Thank you John. very much. I really appreciate your coming in today. Yeah. You're a very articulate man. Thank you. Thank you very much.